Hello, everybody. My name is Bjorn Taltan. I'm the CEO of Mineric. Um, today, I will be talking about utilizing the commercial optical communications market for, uh, for the benefit of the government customer. Especially, we will go into what the uh, what the benefits are, what how the two uh, two markets are uh, in line with each other, where they are different, and how we can ensure that a single market can form that can both serve the commercial market, but also benefit the government mar uh, government customer from uh, the uh, economies of scale that will build in the commercial optical inter-satellite link environment. Before we start with the topic at hand, let me give you a brief introduction to what uh, what Mineric is. Mineric is a German free space, free space optics communications uh, solutions provider with products uniquely in all the domains such as space, air, and in ground stations. We are located in the outskirts of Munich in the town of uh, Gilking. We are a spin-off of the German Aerospace Research Center, uh, the DLR as a company with 11 years of heritage in working with multiple institutes and companies together we have strong partnerships with the likes of the space foundation Leyte in france the european space agency and several u.s universities we have quite an agile staff uh, with the new space mindset and we have about 160 employees across the u.s and germany um, our U.S. subsidiary uh, is located in Hawthorne, California, and has the aim of both doing business development op uh, opportunities, informing our customers of, of, of our capabilities, supporting them, but also uh, customizing our products to the U.S. needs and giving uh, local support in the different programs we run here in the U.S. The company has currently 4,500 square meters of manufacturing cap capabilities and 1,500 square meters of labs. Uh, besides, uh, within those, we have clean room capabilities, both in ISO 5 and 8. And we have another 3,000 square meters of manufacturing facility coming online at the end of uh, 2020, uh, specifically for the, uh, for the manufacturing of telescopes, which are the heart of many of the products that we built today. To go more into the history of Mineric, as I have said, we are an 11-year-old company and we are a spin-off of uh, the German Aerospace um, Research Center. Um, 2009, the company was started um, and the first about nine years of the company was spent in providing solution and prototypes in a project fashion with, with the likes of Airbus and Facebook doing uh, different demonstrations um, in uh, especially in the aviation realm doing one gigabits and then also 10 gigabits and in both in case, both cases uh, breaking the world record for that time. Uh, the, the company has been also active in the U.S. since 2016 and considers the U.S. our beachhead market and our most important market. The company is public since 2018 uh, and around that time also has pivoted itself to, uh, to a product company from a prototype company, meaning that we have currently standard products that we concentrate on and that we are integrating to ensure that we can uh, offer cost-effective solutions with the economies of scale. Um, starting this year, we have started engaging with multiple customers, both in aviation and space domains, to start our joint validation process. Um, as you know, we have uh, won multiple uh, US, uh, US contracts, um, some of them known, some of them unknown, and especially in the aviation realm, that we are working with our customers to validate our products in their platforms to uh, over the next two years to go into an operational rollout where we want to be providing capabilities for anyone who's looking into uh, deploying laser communication terminals for their domain. To give a brief overview of our, of our product portfolio, here are the four products that we currently, um, that we currently offer to our customers. On the left side, you, you see our two ground station uh, terminals, uh, the Rhino on the top left, which is our ground terminal and uh, the armadillo on the bottom. Uh, the Rhino has an aperture size of 400 millimeters where the armadillo is with 200 millimeters. Um, on the top right, you see our Condor flight terminal for space uh, shown is one optical head 
um, it is it is paired with an electronics unit that can drive up to four optical heads from a sin single control unit. And on the bottom right, you see our Hawk Air flight terminal, which is our unit for um, for different aviation platforms, maybe uh, dirigibles, drones, or any type of other airplane. Um, and, um, the our Condor terminal uh, has an aperture size of 80 millimeters, where the Hawk Air terminal has an aperture size of 30 millimeters. As you can see, the Condor terminal is based on a coarse pointing assembly with a mirror, where the Hawk Air assembly is based on a prism. Um, the Hawk Air assembly being unique with uh, such a small form factor uh, and with a single prism getting a beyond hemispherical uh, field of regard. Over the last 11 years, Minerg has developed itself as um, a provider of laser communication terminals, both for the airborne and space segments. Um, 10 years in development, we have uh, in the space segment especially have targeted the mega constellation market, me uh, meaning most of the commercial uh, constellation markets with thousands of terminals um, in need. Um, over the next, last few years, we have seen the de uh, deployment of these commercial constellations, especially with their laser communication capabilities, move to the right. In the meantime, though, we have also seen the U.S. government and many others, uh, many other governments, look into the deployment of uh, of similar constellations for governmental missions as a critical capability. And we have seen uh, the likes of the Space Development Agency and DARPA field missions and actually uh, uh, send out RFPs for the capabilities um, that are needed from the optical inter-satellite link uh, vendors. That at the end means today that Mineric finds itself actually as, um, as, uh, as in, a, in an environment where our first missions for our terminals will be on governmental satellites where um, a few years ago, I think we were more thinking that we would be uh, deploying uh, terminals on, a, on commercial missions first. One such mission is the Space Development Agency's mission to deploy hundreds of satellites into low Earth orbit through multiple layers, such as the tracking, transport, and custody layers. Um, the goal of the Space Development Agency in this, uh, in this mission is to leverage the commercial um, capabilities built by many vendors uh, in support of the, um, of the commercial constellations um, and uh, utilize the same technology and actually the same uh, vendor subset to see if a military um, or a defense uh, constellation can be deployed. Mineric finds itself also in exactly that same uh, in that same environment where we are where we are uh, find uh, where we are seeing that our uh, laser communication terminal de uh, developed for the mega constellations are a very good match for the needs of the space development agency. We find that the space development agency here, together with DARPA, is becoming really a market disruptor. Make uh, not really insisting on setting up a full new stack of requirements, but really looking out there to see what they can pull in from the commercial sector with uh, specifically the, um, the desire to keep the complete constellation and its, its deployment cost efficient and also um, uh, fieldable in a few years only. One of the concepts there that is being uh, matured uh, during the uh, Space Development Agency's uh, uh, TriZero process, which is the first step in uh, demonstrating the capabilities that can be deployed into low Earth orbit, is the inter uh, OSL inter interoperability concept. In this, uh, in this uh, thought process, um, multiple vendors are being asked to co uh, collaborate with, e with each other and understand how the how terminals from two separate vendors can be made to communicate with each other, on, uh, which is definitely a challenge given the fact that until now, most of the OISL vendor work has been driven by internal requirements and not to an external standard. Um, I think the first things first, I think one of the immediate effects, of course, is the fact that this, uh, the start of this process has uh, made all of the major vendors of OISL terminals to sit around the table and start communicating where there was no such impetus until now. Um, 
uh, over a very short period of time, uh, over the course of a few, a few, a few meetings, uh, we probably had many aha moments where we, uh, where we find ourselves understanding each other's terminals and each other's implementations better. And also the reason why it drove us there. We're definitely seeing the fact that there is many aspects that, uh, that have been sold by different companies in, in a multitude of ways, which makes interoperability no easier, of course, but I think overall there is a definite appreciation of where each vendor is coming from and uh, the understanding of the complexities of each type of implementation. Um, we believe that, uh, we, we as Mineric believe, and I think the other vendors do as well, that uh, these uh, these meetings have really resulted in us honing in on the topics that really need additional addressing, such that we can get to a get to a, a common understanding. These these involved forward error correction, polar the use of polarization in TXRX isolation, the implementation of a modulation on the TX beam, and similar topics which each company has done differently and now is being driven to a common understanding and a common solution. So that we can achieve achieve uh, interoperability. Um, also, on the other side, um, st from the start of the program, the SDA uh, OISL Open Standard has pushed for a common satellite bus interface, which I think is going to make the use of any vendor's OISL on any bus easier in the future. We will not have to constantly go back and re uh, re uh, invent the wheel of how to connect an OSL to any satellite uh, in any satellite bus. And of course, one of the big, uh, big drivers is the current strict timeline that the SDA is pushing towards the vendors toward um, in uh, defining a requirements that everyone needs to meet uh, in in defining what needs to be delivered and then verifying it in no later than the end of Q1 2021, which is an ambitious goal, but is the one that is driving all the vendors to uh, to communicate freely and openly and towards uh, towards a common understanding. One of the interesting items that we have we are seeing now as minor, having worked both with the commercial and with government customers, is that they asked most of the time and most of the specifications that are being looked for by commercial customers are quite identical with the ones being asked for by the governmental customers. I think cost efficiency is at the top of the list, uh, followed by a 1550 nanometer based communication, given the fact that already systems are being fielded out there. Uh, 5000 kilometers linked distance is establishing itself even in cases where in certain mega constellations the distances are shorter i think many of them are looking into being able to use their oisls even if their planes are not fully uh, fully loaded with satellites such that uh, link distances are not their standard but in in a skip satellite distance we see all a lot of the uh, commercial constellations, no, all of them looking for a transparent Ethernet interfacing with the OSL. They don't want to deal a lot with just managing the OSL. They want a transparent, simple interface. And of course, we, we see from everyone um, the need to understand a path to a lower size, weight and power of the terminal. That Those are definitely common questions that we get from the government and uh, the commercial sector. Yet in one significant specification, we see a big difference, and that is bandwidth. So I said the Space Development Agency and the other government agencies currently working towards FSO communication are really doing the job of a market disruptor very well. We believe that, and I, see, I think we see that when we go through the uh, interoperability process and many others. Um, yet. On the other side, we see on tranche zero, for example, uh, the SDA envisioning a constellation where the bandwidth requirement is capped at one gigabits per second. In contrast, when we go to commercial constellations today um, and talk with the operators of those, uh, of those satellites, we see the conversation starting at 10 gigabits per second at a minimum, and we immediately see the strong desire to go to much higher bandwidths and, uh, and really quickly. Um, 
we completely understand where the government is coming from and where the one gigabit per second connectivity is coming from because of the high TRL level and the, uh, and the uh, availability of multiple vendors that allow uh, allowed uh, for a uh, assured mission over the next two years. But we have definitely a certain amount of worry there as well. We believe that if we do not bring the uh, government's request um, in line with the commercial constellations request, we will end up diverging from diverging and ending up with two different constellations and two different sets of OISLs and not benefiting from a true commonality between the two. So why are the why are the differences in seg bandwidth so significant? Can the same uh, can the same uh, unit that does a uh, 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit unit also do lower uh, lower data rates? And we actually see that not being the case, or at least in our implementation and in many other implementations that we are seeing out there, um, at least conceptually, we're seeing that the implementation that are being targeted for the uh, lower end, I want to say. Uh, a few megabits to about two and a half to three gigabits, four gigabits, using different technology than the ones that are targeting 10 gigabits and uh, and more. Um, some are in the uh, some are in the use of avalanche photodiodes with associated uh, um, analog to digital converters, or the type of forward error correction methods, or the type of payload data interfacing to the satellite bus. Dates tend to be different once you once you cross that five six gigabit threshold. Um, definitely APDs you're maxing out there, ADCs and their capabilities you, we are maxing out there, and we are worried that that is diverging from the commercial implementations. I think what we're really most worried about is that um, that there is going to be a commercial constellation implementation of an OISL that is not going to be able to support the lower bandwidth and the lower bandwidth will not the lower bandwidth implementation will end up needing way too much uh, upgrade and changes to become a higher bandwidth implementation and therefore the government will uh, will not benefit from the economies of scale that the higher bandwidth OISLs will have uh, by through their use in the mega constellations in the thousands or tens of thousands of units. So in summary, Mineric views the current push of the government to get OSL capabilities in space as quickly as possible as an absolute positive jumpstart for the free space optics terminal market. I think also the interoperability process is paying great dividends already unearthing the main areas where the, the vendors need to find a solution on how to work with each other. May it be uh, the, uh, bus con uh, the bus interface, may it be the air interface in terms of how the digital stream is, is uh, unpacked, may it be the acquisition, uh, acquisition con-ops. I think the focus on cost efficiency and standards will Pay, uh, that will pay dividends for some time to come. We will see, uh, we will see cost being the main driver of decision making going forward for many of the vendors, and I we definitely welcome that. Yet I think the main the main message we want to give today is if we want to stay on a cost efficient course and we want to be able to stay, set commercial standards going forward, we need to make sure that uh, the future future RFPs and future missions baseline alongside with the commercial constellations that they adapt high uh, bandwidth requirements and that they uh, that they look for the capabilities, not just in, um, in terms of which vendor is uh, developing hardware, but also what uh, requirements they are doing that for the commercial constellations for, and actually go towards those requirements as well. We see that the implementation of 10 gigabit plus is absolutely needed um, because it's going to need that level of bandwidth to make the commercial constellation case work. And if we were to, if we were not to use that same uh, requirement for the co uh, government constellations, we will split the market and not let the government benefit from the economies of scale introduced by the uh, by the commercial market. Uh, we believe that the technologies exist today. 
I think um, if we were to do these uh, do these new missions with the up, uh, with the upgraded bandwidth requirements now, I think uh, the vendors can get there in time for the next generation of RFPs uh, to take flight. And uh, we definitely would see that as a welcome next step in the FSO world. Thank you very much. And now I uh, welcome your uh, comments. Thank you.